All right, so if you've all got a Bible, if you'd like to turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Just to warn you, I don't normally drink caffeinated coffee, so I went to the back, got myself a decaf coffee and squirted water in it, but I didn't realize the water I was squirting into it was actually filtered coffee, and I drank it. So if I'm a little bit hyper today, and if I read really quick, you know why, okay? So it's like, oh dear. Because caffeine's like alcohol to me, it just uh, does weird things to me. Yeah, Proverbs chapter 4 and verses 20 to 23. Hallelujah. God is good, amen? It's good to see some joy in the house today in the praise and worship. Hallelujah. It's it's good, eh? Amen. We're, We're starting to get there now. We're starting to get there. It's great. Hallelujah. So it says, My child, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. I'm sure you've all heard this before. Um, you know, most of us have been around for a long time. It's like, yeah, they're a famous passage. But this first, the one I, what bit I want to focus on to start with is where it says, My child. Now, when we read this, we can fall into a default mentality when we read the scriptures. Like, oh, my child, this is either Solomon talking to his son, or it's David talking down to Solomon when he was younger. Now, that's generally how we read it. But but do remember, this is God-breathed scripture. This is inspired by the Holy Spirit himself. So when you read this, where it says, my child, my son, or whatever, it's, you've got to see it in the light in which it's given. It's not Solomon talking to his little boy. It's not David talking to Solomon. It is God talking to you and me, all right? So my child. And so the first two words are really quite profound. My child. So if, you know, if I sit down with Zach or if I sit down with my children and stuff and I chat with them, they're my children. There's nothing, nothing could ever change that, okay? They're always my children. And when they sit down and we chat and stuff, there's, there's that relationship there. There's that love there that we have for one another. And sometimes, as Christians, I think we're good at theologically understanding the Father heart of God. And we understand theologically, yes, I'm a son of God and I'm a daughter of God. But the challenge here is not just to intellectually understand that you're children of God, but to actually understand and, and know emotionally that you are a child of God. To intellectually know something is helpful, it helps you on the way, but to emotionally know that you are a child of God is really quite profound. And so everything that I do now, I'm geared, I'm, you know, all the teaching, all the preaching I've been doing for many, many years has been aiming for the times in which we're coming into. And one of the most quintessential foundations of your Christian faith that we all need to have is understanding first and foremost that you are a child of the living God. And, and not just theologically understand it, but actually knowing it for yourself personally, knowing that you are a child of God. And so when I read this, when I see these words, my child, I see the love of a father for his children. Now, some people are like, well, I don't really get the whole father heart God thing because, you know, my father was rubbish or, or, or you know, I had difficulty with my father growing up. So, and, I, and I get a lot of Christians say that. But you know what? Thank God for Jesus. Because you said, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. We looked at uh, the book of Daniel a few weeks ago where you saw the Ancient of Days seated upon the throne with hair white as wool and eyes of fire. And and I said, who is that? And everyone's like, Jesus. But no, because then the one who's on the throne calls in one who looks like the Son of Man, the Ancient, another one. And he said, and he gave him dominion and power and authority to rule the nations. That's the Son. And then in Revelation, we see that the Son also has hair as white as wool with eyes of fire. Go figure. Why? Because it says in Hebrews chapter 1 that he is the exact likeness of his Father. And in the Greek, it says the exact icon. Now, an icon, we all know what an icon is. It's like a little statue or a little picture that represents someone. So if you have seen Jesus, you have seen the icon of the Father. So if you have a problem with Father God, you don't really need to. Because Jesus 
If you've seen Jesus and you've experienced Jesus, then you have seen the Father and you've experienced the Father. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't the Father and the Father isn't the Son. But this is the point, is that you can learn the Father heart of God through his Son. If you struggle with, with, you know, with a Father and you're like, I can't, I, can't, I can't get this, then you need to understand that Jesus, everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, when he washed his disciples' feet, that was as good as the Father doing it. Well, that's mind-blowing, isn't it? Because here it says, my child, my child, you, every one of us here, we are children of God. And so my child also infers relationship. This is, again, another really key point. John 17, 3, it's a really important verse for me, says, eternal life is... Living forever. No, that's not what it says. It says eternal life is knowing God and the Son whom you sent. That is eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God. When I first got saved, or Jesus got me saved, I came from witchcraft to Christ. And one of the things that Jesus said to me when he appeared, he said, come to know me. And that's the invitation to every believer is to come to know God. Now, I meet lots of Christians that know a lot about God. They know their Bibles really well, but they don't know him. If I was to wake up every day, right, and I came to my beautiful wife, and I just talked at her for 15 minutes, read a bit of a book, and then went to work, then woke up the next day, spoke at her for 15 minutes. I'm not interested in what she's got to say back to me. I was just, 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 just hear me. I've got, I've got to say what I'm saying. And then, uh, okay. what, what kind of a relationship, what kind of a marriage do you think that I would have? Terrible. Terrible. And yet God is a relational being, yet we treat him exactly the same. I'll give him 15 minutes in the morning, blah, 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 and you spew out, no, and you give him all your supplications and sessions, as you should, but we don't take the time to listen, and then we read the Bible, and then we zoom out, and we go to our work. And all the time, I had this picture this morning, because I used to do this back in the day, you know, when, I, when you first get saved. I had this picture this morning that whilst I'm doing my prayer time, and I'm going, blah, 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 Jesus is sat there going, Chris, Chris, Chris. And I'm reading my Bible. Oh, I'm feeling so spiritual right now. I've got goosebumps. Chris, Chris. Anyway, I'll see you later, Jesus. Hallelujah. I've done a quiet time. Woo-hoo! Now I go out the door, and all the time is going, Chris. Chris, because I'm not listening to him. I, I, and that's the thing, Christianity is not about just us being priests unto God and just giving him supplication, intercession. You're also children of the living God, which means that you have to have a relationship with him. You know, often we would like, excuse me, often we would like Jesus to make it easy for us, wouldn't we? So like, why can't he just come to our, down to our level? Why does he have to speak in such obtuse, uh, it's a weird way sometimes, especially with dreams and visions. Like, what does that mean? Why can't he just come down to our level and just, just tell us simply, right? No. He did it once before. When did he do it? When God took on flesh, condescended himself, came down to our level, became as one of us, so that we could become like him, so that we might become partakers of his divine nature. And then it says in Revelation 4, come up here, that I may show you the things that are to come. In other words, Jesus came down, he came like as one of us, so that we could become like him, we become partakers of his divine nature, he's gone back up, and now in Hebrews 4 it says, now you come boldly to the throne of grace, which ain't down here, but he's up there, hallelujah. So we don't bring God down to our level now, now as sons and daughters of the living God, we've got to go up to his level, we've got to pursue the living God, amen? Hallelujah. Well, we're getting a lot just from my child this morning, this is great. My child. Hallelujah. And so that's, that's the first thing that's really important about this opening passage, is that we understand that we have a relationship with a relational being, God. Yeah? Don't think of him as just somehow he's like, well, he's up there, he's aloof, he's remote. He's a living, personal, infinitely powerful being that loves you. And loves you that much that he gave Jesus, his only son, for you and for me. I don't know about you, but that's love. And that's love. Would I give up one of my kids to save some people? That's what we're talking about here. And, and, and God knowingly, he would give up his son to a people that for the most part would laugh and scoff and mock him. 
Yeah? Hallelujah. My child, be attentive to my words. My words. Now, there's some beautiful, beautiful stuff in this, because this just, just like warps my mind. That be attentive to my word, or be attentive to my words. And Jesus is the word. Amen. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And then in John 7, 1, 17, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. All right. So Jesus is the word and he is the word in flesh. Hallelujah. And the word of God is living and it is active. And Jeremiah 1, 12, the Holy Spirit watches over his word to perform it. All right. This is like, wow, this is great. And then Jesus in his pre-incarnate form in the Old Testament prophesied the word that he would become the word in flesh. And at some point in history, the word that he spoke entwined him with flesh and he came down and dwelt amongst us and the word became flesh and hallelujah, he's gone back into heaven. So my child, be attentive to my words. It's not just words, but we're talking about the word as well. Be attentive to my word. Be attentive to my son. Be attentive to the things that I am saying. You know, we live in a world, right, where I'm just, you know, please forgive me, but come on, guys. You know how evil it's getting out there. Now, Christians have this pre because you're British Christians, okay? So you're generally, you're generally what I call nice Christians, okay? And so nice Christians generally think everybody else is nice as well, don't they? Well, you know, politicians wouldn't lie. Um, you know, all right, you guys are obviously clearly not fooled. Good, hallelujah. <laughs> but this is the nonsense that I get. And it's the same with the media. It's like, oh, but the media is so unbiased and it's so well informed. You know, you've got to understand Satan is the lord of the power of the air. And, you know, he deals with that second heaven, powers and principalities. We see this in the book of Daniel, where you have uh, angels fighting in the heavenly realms to take over territories and places like that. But Satan is the lord of the power of the airwaves as well. You honestly think that CNN, uh, Sky, BBC are not working in some way for the bad guy, giving us propaganda, telling you things, and yet we're more attentive to that sometimes and I, and I see Christians going way off being with some stuff and it's like it's like so for example we know what the BBC says about and I'll get political for a second please forgive me but this is a point that's worth making the BBC might have their opinion on the Middle East crisis as will CNN as will Sky and as will all news stations but who cares what their opinion is and yet the Christians are like oh just lap it up but the Bible says, be attentive to my words. What is God's heart concerning the Middle East? What's, what, what does the scripture say about those things? Oh, yeah, but Chris, this is my opinion on the Middle East crisis. This is why nobody cares what your opinion is. Actually, I'm sorry. I don't care. I only care what God's opinion is. That's what we've got to do. We've got to be attentive to his word. Oh, but Chris, it's down to interpretation. No, no, it really isn't. Okay. Be attentive to my words. Hear what I am saying. Incline your ear. You know when a dog, you know, dogs are trying to understand what you're saying. So, hello boy, come here. And he goes, hmm? yeah. right? That's what we've got to be like. We've got to be like, Jesus is talking to us. Hmm? Yeah, incline your ear to his voice. Okay? And, to, and pay attention to what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Do not let them escape from your sight and keep them within your heart. You see, this is really important. The safest place to put the word of God is in our heart because sometimes things in this world can get right down into our heart and that can cause us to become offended and can cause all kinds of problems for us. How do you keep things within your heart? You see, we're coming into difficult days. I don't know if you've noticed that, okay? And if you're not careful, you can be overwhelmed by the things that are going on in the world. And I like to take a note out of the Blessed Virgin Mary, okay? Why am I calling her blessed? Because she said, blessed am I among women, so I'm not going to disagree with her, okay? So the Blessed Virgin Mary, she, she, when she, she had prophecies given to her, 
Okay, we had Anna the prophetess came up to her, and we also had Simeon who prophesied to her and said, you know, your, your heart will be pierced with many sorrows. And, and, and obviously the, the shepherds came to her, and they saw, they saw angels, and this is who this is. And it says she treasured these things in her heart. She pondered on them. She meditated on them. And that's what we need to be doing. Sometimes we see the world outside saying something and screaming and it looks awful and it looks frightening, but we must take the time to think about things and ponder these things in our heart so the reality of our external world does not affect the reality of what God has already said to us, especially in respect to like prophetic words. I know some women um, and, and fathers that, are, that have seen their children go right to the very edge and it looks like all is lost. But because they had a single word, a single prophetic word, or a scripture that God had given them, they have given everything in prayer and intercession. They just know. I know how bad it looks. I know how terrible it's become. Yet I know my God said. And it's that word that's in your heart. It's that thing that will give you hope to keep you going when all despair is all around you. Because despair is coming. Hallelujah. But we are of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But if you've got your mindset in the things of the world and you've allowed the things of the world to pierce your heart, then you and I will be shaken with the world. God does not want us to be shaken with the world. Amen. He wants us to be a people that are strong in these days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So for, the, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Do you know what? I, I really think as Christians we underestimate the power of the living word of God. Satan knows its power. You know, in Ephesians 6 it says that the, 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 the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Yeah, we know it's the sword of the Spirit. Hallelujah. I read my Bible every day. Amen. That's my sword of the Spirit. No, that's not what it says. It doesn't say in the Greek, uh, the sword of the Spirit is the graphe, which means the written word. It doesn't say it's the logos. It says it's the rhema, which means it's the spoken and the announced and proclaimed word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Why does it God choose to work that way? And why does scripture and the power of the spoken word so powerful? Because that's the God you serve. That's how he created the universe. He spoke it into being. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And the Holy Spirit watches over the word of God to perform it. And if you've got nothing coming out of your mouth but negativity and silly nonsense, you're giving God nothing to work with in your life. If you're struggling or wrestling with depression, or you need healing, or you need a miracle, you need a breakthrough, you've got to get the word of God in your heart, and you've got to, as the Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and then you shall be saved. And it's the same, if you want to be healed, if you want to be set free, if you want to be delivered, get the word of God in there, believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth, and it will happen. Amen. Now, there's a thing called faith and patience, right? Abraham, Abraham, sorry, had to have his name changed to Abraham. Hey, everybody! I'm father of many nations. Dude, you haven't even got a kid yet. But yeah, but I'm the father of many nations. And you called those things that were not as though they were, just like I'm wearing this shirt right now. Come on, sunshine. Come on, more sunshine. I'm wearing this shirt as a declaration of faith that in Britain, we will see a ball of fire in the sky soon. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. For they are life to all those that find them, and healing to their flesh. The word of God can actually heal us. It can save you. you know, the word of God, I love it. It's so powerful because you are born again of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Hang on a minute. Think about this. You're born again. Right? We don't even really know what that means, do we? We're like, well, we kind of know in principle and on paper what it means, but we don't really know what it means. I don't think anyone does. It's a mystery. But think about this. You're born again. Yes, hallelujah, my spirit's saved. My soul is being saved. My body will be saved. Very good. Good, good answer. But that word of God, right, let's just say, let's just say we're 500 years in the past, okay, just so, because I, I won't get hate mail otherwise. So we're 500 years in the past, okay, because if I say in 200 years Jesus returns, I'll get hate mail. So no, he's going to be here next year. Okay, so let's go back in time. We're 500 years ago, right? We've all died. Right? Your bodies are in the ground, and now it's the year 2024, okay? Let's say Jesus turns in like, I don't know, 10 years' time. So Jesus comes back. How much do you think is going to be left of you in the ground from 500 years? All right? There won't be any arms, there won't be any legs, there won't be any bones, but lots of powder, okay? Dust. You've gone back to dust, all right? 
But the word of the living God will see that dust and can reconstruct like the valley of dry bones and out of the ground will come all of these skeletons and all their bones start to reform and flesh come upon them. You know, never done these cheesy movies where everyone gets taken up and the tracksuits are left. This is like full on, okay, full on these things coming out of the ground and flesh coming back on them and then life coming back into them. And not only are they being given a, a, a body, but it's an immortal body. I mean, can you even imagine a body that cannot be damaged, that can never get fat, never get bold, never get old? Woohoo! Glory be to God. The men are loving this sermon. Okay, are you looking forward to that day? That's the power of the living word of God, that it can raise you from dust and powder and bring you back to life immortal. That's the power of the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. That's God's words to us. And yet it's just like, well, you know, don't we... Do, you know, we just don't realize the power of what we've got in our hands. The thing is, Satan, he knows the power. He knows full well. And if he can keep the church asleep, if he can keep her drowsy enough, she will not know who she is. Because the church is something to be feared in the spirit realm. And it's time for us to be something that is feared in the spirit realm. But you see, the church needs to get her groove back. She needs to know who she is in Christ Jesus. She needs to know that while she's down here on the earth, we wrestle against powers and principalities. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Yet on Facebook we do. I don't agree with what you say, and you don't agree with what I say, and we have big fights. It's like, no dudes, you're not supposed to wrestle against flesh and blood. We're supposed to wrestle against powers and principalities, okay? All right, a whole nother level. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The word there for life in the Greek is zoe. It means this over the top, evanescent. It's the, it's the very essence of God flowing into you. That same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is at work in your mortal body, giving you zoe life. Jesus has come that you might have zoe life and have Zoe life in abundance. Now, Zoe life is abundant life. So when he says have Zoe life, which is abundant life, in abundance, he's saying have life and life and more life times life times life times life times life multiplied by a power of a billion. That's the kind of life that Jesus wants you to have. Please don't think that means you get to drive a Rolls Royce and wear a nice watch. It's so much more than that. This is talking about the power and the life of God within the brothers and sisters, which is in his church. Hallelujah. We need to be attentive to incline our ear to his sayings. I love it in, in the revelation of John where it says, when he's writing to the seven churches, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not what your intellect says, not what the news tells you, but what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying to the church in this hour? Yeah, wake up. Okay, in the nicest part. Well, I don't know if he's being nice about it or not. I mean, just wake up. I like it when Peter, he's in prison, and, he's, uh, and it says an angel comes over to him and <laughs> kicks him. I mean, it's like, ooh. I mean, how unkind. That's not very nice, is it? As Christians, we're supposed to be nice, aren't we? No. Don't you believe that lie? That Christians are supposed to be nice. What are you not? Wake up. You're not supposed to be nice Christians. You're supposed to be loving Christians. And sometimes loving people is doing things that aren't nice. Like telling them something they don't want to hear. All right? Because that's actually the kindest and most loving thing to do. The Bible says an open, rebu or an open rebuke is better than love concealed. Yeah, don't be nice. Unless it's to me. Be nice to me. So... Be attentive to my sayings. And the Spirit is speaking to his church in this hour. You know, all, you know, there's a lot of prophets out there all saying the same thing. And it's, it's good to, when you hear that chorus of that unison of the, of the voice of the prophets, the Spirit is speaking to his church, which is we are fast approaching the end of days. It's time to wake up. It's time to get that battle armor on again, amen? It's time to, uh, well, we've all got a little bit out of shape, amen? It's time to get back in the gym. 
I know some of you are thinking, I'm not out of shape, I'm pretty good shape. I'm talking spiritually, okay? I mean, if I put my spiritual glass, like, dude, actually, but I'll just leave those off, okay? If we had a good look at some of ourselves, we probably wouldn't be very proud of ourselves spiritually. It's like, man, I need to, I need to work on that midriff a little bit there, okay? We need to get ourselves, and need to get ourselves toned up. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, how rude. I'm talking about your spiritual body, okay? That's all invisible, I can't see it. But God wants his church to get fighting fit, to get ready for the days in which we're coming into. Because it's not going to be pretty and it's not going to be easy, but God has provided all of our needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. And it's time for the church to start declaring stuff and knowing who she is and be bold and be brave and be strong for the Lord our God is with us because we are heading to the end of days. And as we were worshipping today, I just felt this. This has been bubbling around in me uh, for a couple of days now, so I'm just going to say this. As a declaration, as a church, to all the powers and all the principalities that reside over this area. We will not go quietly into the night. We are the church of Christ and we will fight from the ashes of our seeming demise, we will rise because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We've overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Even in death, we are victorious. O oh, death, where is your sting? We will face you off, O oh, evil, at the end of days. We are the church militant. We will fight for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but powerful to the tearing down of strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and dominions and principalities. Christ has made us alive together in him. We are more than victorious through Christ. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Jesus, our victorious king, is coming back on clouds of glory. And when he comes back on, on clouds of glory, these aren't pretty little fluffy English clouds. These are the clouds of God's glory. These are clouds of fire and lightning and darkness. And the Son of Man will be riding on those, on those clouds with his warrior horse. And he will come down. And with the sword of his mouth, he will destroy the antichrist he will destroy the power of satan he will destroy the power of evil and our god is coming and the bible says when you see these signs lift up your head for your redemption is nigh for the world seeing christ coming back will be the most terrifying thing where they say oh mountains fall on us hide us from this sight but for the church it will be Woo-hoo! jesus is back jesus is back jesus is back hallelujah the kingdom of god is here glory <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you're, you're too English. You're too English. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming back soon. Hallelujah. My child, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. If there's ever a time in history where the church needs to be attentive to the things of the Spirit, if there's ever a time where the church needs to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, and do you know what I hear the Spirit saying to the churches? The Spirit and the bride say, come. The trouble is, the bride isn't saying that, but the Spirit is saying, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And Christ wants his church to say, come, Lord Jesus. It should be our prayer every day. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Make me ready, Lord Jesus. Let me fight for you, Lord Jesus. Let me lay down my life for you, Lord Jesus. Let everything that I am be a living sacrifice for you, Lord Jesus. Because when you're in the end of days, who cares about your golf swing? When you're in the end of days, who cares about that diploma in swimming that you're trying to get? Who cares? Why not lay down your life for the Christ who gave down his life for us in the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. And in the words of Keith Green, I'll close on this, where he says, Hey, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But you, you can't even get out of bed. Amen.